Hi, everyone. Hope you're having a great Thursday so far. My name is Cam. I'm a product marketing manager here at Vendasta. And today we will be discussing how to engage your on-site customers in a post-COVID environment. We have a special guest today, Omar Samiri, CEO of iVision Mobile. And he will lead today's uh, presentation and discussion. So if you have any questions, you can um, you know, put it in the chat. You can also unmute yourselves and, and ask. Um, but otherwise, uh, if you're only listening, please mute yourself so we don't hear any background noise. And with that, we can get started. Thanks for joining us, Omer. Okay, thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. I appreciate you all taking the time to sit on this presentation today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about engaging consumers in a pandemic environment and what that means for the typical yeah, business can you owner. I'm going to assume call. So my name is Omer, and my company is called iVision Mobile. I wanted to give you all a quick uh, brief intro on myself and our company. So uh, co-founder and CEO of iVision Mobile, we founded and launched the company in 2006. So we're a 15-year uh, veteran uh, boutique software development company, and we're based in Los Angeles. And we are focused on essentially developing mobile communications technology. And this is for businesses of all sizes and types. We work with uh, large brands such as Coca-Cola, Clorox, NBA sports teams, but we also work with small mom and pop local businesses throughout North America, uh, U.S. and Canada, and also uh, U.S. Uh, territories. Uh, currently, we have about 7,500 active system users um, that, that leverage our technology, and we recently launched in the Vendasta marketplace with a gray label solution for Vendasta partners and agents. Uh, just a quick sampling of the many industries that we work with. We work with the automotive sector, both car washes, car dealerships, service drives, things of that nature, uh, dining, uh, both quick serve, sit down dining establishments, uh, education facilities such as high schools, um, elementary, private charter schools, as well as universities, um, entertainment establishments, financial institutions, <clears throat> excuse me, financial institutions such as banks and credit unions, uh, as well as healthcare facilities. This includes both uh, independent healthcare practitioners such as chiropractors, doctor's offices, uh, things of that nature, and also uh, hospitals, urgent care facilities, things like that. Uh, we work within the hospitality sector, uh, nonprofits, a lot of charities and, and, uh, and, and nonprofit organizations utilize our technology, as well as personal services, things like med spas, hair salons, nail salons, spas are very active with our technology, uh, religious organizations, retail, 100%, uh, and then sporting establishments like sports teams, uh, such as NBA teams, things like that. Um, so we're going to cover a few things today. We're going to talk about the pandemic and its impact on business. And, and many of you are going to be very much in tune with, with much of what we're going to be discussing today because it's very evident in society and, and everything around us. So uh, it won't be anything new. Uh, the pandemic's effect on consumer behavior and then what this really has reinforced or taught us as business owners, as entrepreneurs, as consultants uh, to business owners. Um, and basically, that's going to be the underlying uh, theme here is that communication is mission critical uh, for a business owner. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about engaging consumers in a pandemic environment. And then finally, we'll cap off with a couple case studies uh, looking at both on and off site engagement, as well as uh, just doing a quick uh, review of mobile industry updates and compliance. Uh, as of late, there have been some changes in the marketplace. Uh, and then we'll kind of cap it off with Q&A. If you have any questions throughout this conversation, this is a conversation. So uh, although uh, we certainly ask that you stay muted, but uh, do include your, your questions in the chat. And I'll, I'll take a quick glance over as we go through this presentation to see if there's questions as we go through it. So uh, with that said, let's get started. Uh, and I think there's just somebody there that's, that's not muted. So if you wouldn't mind just muting yourself, that would be very helpful. Um, all right, so the pandemic and its impact on businesses. Um, we've been dealing with temporary and permanent closures. We've been dealing with changes to operations and procedures. And this has been across the board for every business out there. Um, limitations on contact with customers, with prospects and staff. Um, reduced capacity occupancy restrictions, right? Metered occupancy. 
And there's been really a heavy focus on clean and sterile facilities and cleanliness and, and routine cleaning. Um, and then lastly, there's been this really inconsistent supply and demand where, you know, things are off the shelf and, and products are unavailable. And so this is really is translated into a lot of confusion for everybody involved, right? The business owners, their employees, their staff, the consumers, et cetera. So there's been a lot of confusion across the board. And so if we look at the effect on consumer behavior, we've seen that in the form of social distancing and sensitivity to crowds and lines. Um, we've seen it with the sensitivity to touch, right? Who wants to touch things like credit card terminals and hard copy menus, pens and pencils? Uh, every time somebody hands me a pen to sign, sign a receipt, I'm a little bit weary. Okay, has this been wiped down? Um, you know, and now, and, and things like digital loyalty tablets and kiosks uh, or pagers at dining establishments, right? They hand you a pager and they say your, your table, you know, your table will be ready when this thing vibrates. Who wants to hang on to those devices nowadays? So there's really been kind of a push to embrace touchless technology. And this includes things like mobile payments and Google and Apple Pay. I'm readily ready to go with, with my mobile wallet, you know, every chance I get so I don't have to insert my credit card. Um, QR code scanning for menus, digital menus, and then lastly, curbside pickup. So this has really been kind of the overall effect on consumer behavior that we've seen in retail uh, brick and mortar establishments here over the last few months. And so what this has really kind of, you know, I say reinforced because as business owners, this is kind of business 101. Uh, so we, it really hasn't taught us this. It's reinforced this is that businesses must continually evolve to survive. And this means addressing consumers changing needs and sensitivities. This means embracing new technologies. And this means adapting to some of those external forces that we're dealing with in the, in the marketplace. Also, communication is mission critical. 100% uh, for a business to be able to communicate. Um, and a business should be able to utilize multiple channels, right? They should be able to utilize social media, mobile, direct mail, on-site communication, as well as email communication. So a business should be doing all of the above, really, in terms of communication. And, and when you look at the types of communication, there's really two types of communication. There's marketing communication, and then there's non-marketing communication. So it really should be a, a combination of both. And what we found was that businesses that communicated regularly during the shutdown with a, a list of opt-in consumers, they were really miles ahead, steps ahead of the competition. Um, you know, I, countless times I drove by the local dining establishments in my neck of the woods in Los Angeles and had to like, you know, peek out my car window to see if they were open and servicing customers and exactly what the case was. So I think just having that communication is really mission critical for a business in terms of, of uh, continuity. Now, who are businesses communicating with, right? They're communicating with a variety of groups. They're communicating with their customers. They're communicating with their prospects. And they're also communicating with their employees. So if you look at the nature of their communication, it's really they're communicating with different groups in different ways. So what methods are businesses using to communicate with their customers? And if we peel at each one of these individually and, and look at each one on its own, how effective are these different messaging channels? And if we look at email, you know, businesses should be doing email as part of their transactional communication and their marketing communication. But, you know, to what extent is email riddled with spam and, and junk? And what are your open rates? Under 1%, 1 to 3% maybe? Um, now, if you look at websites and social media, really, these are great and they're a must-have and very integral to a brand and, and the brand's communication, but it requires a consumer to kind of actively search out and monitor and subscribe to these social media channels. So it's, it's, it's you know, active engagement on behalf of the consumer. Um, then you have direct mail. And, and personally, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a product of, of – uh, the 20, I'm not a product of the 21st century, I'm much older than that, but I can tell you that, you know, my, my personal feeling on direct mail is that it's, you know, straight to the trash, at least with most consumers nowadays and quite expensive. Um, on-site signage is also great, but it's limited to the on-site customers. So how does that get to the off-site customers? It doesn't. So uh, it's limited to your on-site. And then lastly, we have text messaging or mobile communication, 
And the nice thing about text messaging or mobile is that it's immediate, right? The delivery of the message is really determined by the sender. So when the business owner wants to reach that consumer, that prospect, that's how it works versus the opposite way around. Um, it's also preferred by most people nowadays. So we started this company back in 2006, and, and those you know, were kind of the pioneering days of text messaging. We still had to prove the concept. We have to you know, tell the, the business owner why we felt text messaging was, was so powerful. But if you look at the fact that it's 2020 going into 2021, and you look at just the wide age demographic – of people who are texting and relying on text messaging and prefer text messaging communication versus some of the other channels, I think you know that's kind of um, eliminated those initial hurdles. And it's really effective. If you look at the open rate on text messaging, it's upwards of 98%. Very rarely do you receive a text message that you don't glance at. So, um, and then ultimately, you know, now in, in coronavirus days, it's touchless right? It's touchless communication. So that is a huge, huge component. And we saw a huge surge in activity in March because businesses were needing this method of communicating effectively and efficiently and touchlessly. So engaging consumers in a pandemic environment, we look at both off-site engagement and we look at on-site engagement and they're, they're different. And so examples of off-site engagement are things like updates and alerts, right? Um, changes in operations, uh, different products or services, things like that. <clears throat> well wishes, you wanna stay top of mind with your contacts. Not every message is a sales solicitation. Sometimes it's just about letting the consumer know, hey, we wish you the best during these very difficult times. We're here for you should you need us, right? It's just staying top of mind. And things like marketing and sales offers um, and that type of communication, you know, really you want to be extra sensitive, extremely extra sensitive with this type of communication during these times. So you don't want to be over salesy, over pitchy, you know, when people are dealing with this adverse economic environment and living environment and just be obviously extra sensitive to people's, um, you know. And then with regards to on-site engagement, you have things like curbside pickup communication, uh, guest list and wait list communication, loyalty programs, and scannable QR codes, right, to get menus and to get some additional information. So these are the different types of communication, both off-site and on-site. And if you look at examples of this and, and how they are used within our technology, we have a curbside pickup solution where a consumer can pull up and text a code chew a number or scan a QR code, and that then communicates or allows them to communicate via text message and fill out a form where they provide information on, on what curbside stall they're in, and then the business owner can easily identify or the, or the person working can easily identify who that order is, uh, who that order is and, and proceed to deliver that, um, that order to the curbside pickup. Um, things like on-site on-site uh, wait list and metered occupancy, right? So how many businesses now are dealing with metered occupancy, 25% capacity, 50% capacity, and they have to manage a list and a wait, and they might have people that are coming to the establishment for different things. Maybe it's, a, it's an online order pickup, or maybe it's a private shopping, whatever the case may be. So things like being able to hop in line and communicate with those people <clears throat> via wait list, you know, these are all things that can be achieved with the technology. And then lastly, you have things like the digital kiosk. And I'm just going to take a quick sip of water here. The digital kiosk really kind of revolutionized our business and our clients' businesses over the years because it allowed the consumer a really easy channel to key in their phone number and join a mobile club. And so when you look at building a database for a business and doing it quickly and effectively and really maximizing the response, <clears throat> the kiosk has really been mission critical and, and the key for a lot of the brick and mortar businesses that we work with, whether it's a med spa or a boutique or a smoothie shop or whatever the case may be. So this has been an integral part of the on-site engagement, the on-site communication. Now, of course, as of March, all of this changed, right? 
Who wants to touch an extra tablet? Who wants to touch a tablet that somebody else is, has touched previously that's not getting uh, wiped down? And so that's where, you know, a little bit of that approach shifted to things like the check-in manager. And so this check-in manager is one of our tools, but it's designed to be more of an employee-facing dashboard. And now the employee can be the one that is managing that customer experience, checking somebody into a rewards program, um, redeeming a coupon on their behalf. And so this can actually be managed from any POS screen or any dedicated tablet. So uh, it becomes truly touchless for the customer. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's look at a couple case studies, just uh, of different use cases, you know, over the last few months with our technology. So the first is uh, Rare Books Bar and J. Theodore Restaurant. So it's, it's actually two side-by-side -side establishments owned by the same owner. And they're located in Frisco, Texas. I don't know. I think everybody's kind of all over the country here. Uh, we're based in Los Angeles. Um, but I think everybody's kind of everywhere. So in Frisco, Texas, uh, they started in September of 2019. And when you look at their on-site communication, they're using the kiosk check-in manager to, uh, at the host stand to check people in uh, upon arrival to the restaurant or to the bar and, and manage that entire experience and the customer profile as well. They keep track of, of whiskey preferences and, and all that through the system. Um, they also use it for the wait list when they are on a wait. And as far as off-site engagement, they do things like mobile coupons, weekly communication, where they send uh, tasting alerts, you know, if they do different uh, li uh, whiskey or bourbon tastings, um, and then they do live music showcases. And so you can see here an example of uh, the message that you might receive. You know, all tables have been seated and you've been added to the wait list. You're number four in line. I will text you as soon as we have availability. And then if they go on a long wait, what they do is they send a coupon to the restaurant, right? So if, if somebody goes to the bar and there's a way to get in, they send them a coupon to the restaurant next door, which is genius because it's the same owner. So uh, those people come in, you know, they click the link, and this is what the digital, the mobile coupon looks like, and then they redeem it. And so they've had a 30% redemption rate on these coupons to the next door restaurant for people that are waiting to get into the bar. So really unique <clears throat> unique uh, use case there. And then the, the second case study is M. Frederick. And those of you that are based uh, or in Los Angeles, uh, you might be familiar with M. Frederick. They're a, a women's clothing boutique. Uh, they have eight locations across California. And they also um, are in a lot of the, uh, the airports nationwide under, um, under private label uh, boutique brands. So that's not M. Frederick in the airports, but um, it's all private label. But they do have eight locations in, in, in the California area and or Southern California, I should say. Uh, they've been using the system now for four years. They have 19,000 contacts in their database. Now, as far as their on-site communication, they have the digital loyalty kiosk, which is how the consumer opts in and joins the program initially. Um, and as far as their off-site communication, they basically do mobile coupons and their bi-weekly communication. So every other week they send out a message. Uh, most recently with changes in operations and well wishes. So what you see here is two examples. The first message was an MMS message that they sent with um, basically announcing their closures, right? They decided to close all eight locations effective through the dates to help prevent the spread. And then in April, uh, April 22nd, they sent out a thinking of you, right? This is a well wishes. Things have been these have been trying times for many, and we sincerely hope that you and yours remain healthy. So there's really there's nothing to this message other than just staying top of mind and, and kind of spreading a good vibe. And that's what it takes for businesses nowadays to really kind of thrive uh, and, and survive during these times and, and, and get to the end of this. So um, they have to really think outside the box. Um, <clears throat> what's nice is that this year alone, they've had over 2,100 people join the program. And they've sent 400,000 messages in 2020. So you can see how that, once that volume of contacts, that database of contacts starts to grow and that messaging becomes very consistent, the business embraces it and it becomes an, uh, a, a core, kind of the core of their messaging to, uh, to their consumers, their customers and, and prospects. So with all that said, 
I don't see any questions here thus far, so I'll just kind of keep keep plugging away here. Um, and I hope I'm not moving too fast. I've, I've covered a lot of stuff here. Um, there are some industry changes that are happening, and it's important to note that uh, there's a big shift happening in the industry with how the carriers are handling messaging. And so it's important to note that if you're considering this for any of your customers, that you understand some of these bigger forces that are happening uh, within the industry as you explore uh, if this is going to work for, your, for some of your clients. So here's a few tips to answer some initial questions from your customers. So the first question you're going to be asked is, I have a customer list and I want to message these customers. How do I import this list and start messaging customers? And the answer is, there really is no importing customer phone numbers to send marketing messages. And the reason that that is the case is because in 2013, the government uh, and the FCC, they amended a federal law called the TCPA, and they basically indicated that as of 2013, anybody that wants to receive ongoing marketing messages needs to give prior express written consent. Um, what that means is that just because a person has purchased uh, your services or your goods or uh, is a customer of yours does not necessarily indicate that they've also consented to receiving your marketing communication. So they really want to distinguish between the two. So um, that, is, that is a typical no, we cannot import the customer phone number uh, unless you've received consent. And we can help you navigate that discussion with your customers to determine, okay, you know, did they give consent? How was consent provided? Things like that. Now, there are case-by-case -case exceptions for those that are already text marketing. So if they're using a system to do text message communication, then 100% then, uh, we can look at those as exemptions, uh, exceptions to the rule. Uh, with regards to political groups here, uh, you're 100% right in that there are a lot of providers out there that will gladly take a list and import it in, allow these people to send these, these, mar these communication. And these are people that have obtained voter registration files and they've imported these phone numbers. And, and that's something that we actually do not condone and we don't allow. And we make it very clear to our clients and our, our licensees that this is not something that's supported because uh, typically they, uh, they get this data without people's consent um, and, and they feel like just because the person's a voter, then, then you can message them. So um, we'll talk a little bit about how your clients can get to consent. Most, most notably, the kiosk is how you get consent. The customer is typing in their phone number uh, on the kiosk, and there is a disclaimer language on the kiosk that um, establishes that consent. And then if you're using the check-in manager, you can do a double opt-in, so it can then send a message to the consumer asking them to reply yes to join, and that's where you can establish the consent. So depending on how you're looking to do it, um, you know, you, it, it, it uh, can be set up uh, to make sure that you get the right consent. Um, I'm sure there's some loopholes to, to the whole political messaging, uh, but definitely not something uh, that we advocate on our system. So every, every provider you'll find um, has different um, acceptability of things that are not necessarily allowed. And so we are very conservative uh, with our system because we know the ramifications of, of not being conservative, uh, whether it be a class action lawsuit or a disabling of a short code or something like that. So we never want to have any, any of that happen to uh, us or our clients or you or anything like that. Um, we encourage our clients to build an opt-in list organically. They want to build their data organically, and they want to do it using a kiosk and other tools such as web forms, texting in a keyword, scanning a QR code. This is how a business does it. They do it organically. Um, another is that the disclaimer language must be clearly displayed on call to action. So we go through training with you. We also have FAQs uh, and some videos that we've done that, that will be prepared for you that talk about the disclaimer language and where it must be displayed definitely encourage you to read that. And then when you, think, when you look at things like non-marketing transactional communication, it is less restrictive. So it really is kind of a case-by-case -case, uh, use case perspective in terms of how your users plan on utilizing the, te the technology. But when a business is doing something like appointment reminders or your car is ready for pickup, the guidelines are much less restrictive in terms of obtaining consent. However, a business can very clear, very, very quickly go from one side to the other. So it's really important that if they're going to be using it for non-marketing communication, that you really establish that 
and, and designate that there's a difference uh, with regards to consent. Um, now, as far as industry changes, these are things that are happening over the next year or so. <clears throat> and this is the most notable one, which is the carriers are, are starting to discontinue support for shared short codes. So much of what we do over the last 15 years has involved shared short codes. Short codes are very expensive. They're not cheap. They're anywhere from $500 to $1,000 per month. And the typical business owner is not going to be able to afford that. So they use companies that provide shared short codes. Essentially, we cover the cost of that short code, and we provide it to all of our clients at no cost. And so that is how much of the industry has operated for the last 20 or so years. Um, so with that said, the carriers have said, okay, we're going to stop supporting shared short codes because there's too many operating on too many brands essentially operating on one number that they can't keep track of who's sending what messages and they don't want people to be um, in ad adversely affected by a bad apple right so you don't want one person kind of messing it up for others and and i totally get that so what they're doing is they're shifting to a one brand one messaging code approach and i'm saying messaging code because a short code is really not the only way to send messages there are really three ways to send messages. You can use a short code, and that short code, be, uh, short code could be dedicated or shared. You can use what's called a 10 DLC, which is a 10 digit local number, or you can use a text enabled toll free number. Okay, and they're all different, and the carriers are adopting a commercial grade A to P. Commercial grade, A to P stands for application to person. So commercial volume, you know, system-based messaging. Uh, four 10-digit lo local numbers. But uh, the cross-carrier support is still coming. It's not here yet. So right now, if you are receiving messages from a 10-digit local number, it's P to P, meaning it's it's one-on-one. -on -one. There's no volume capabilities there. So a company like M. Frederick that's sending a message to 19,000 people, they can never use a 10 DLC currently because it will get blocked in a heartbeat. So instead, many clients use text-enabled toll-free numbers because toll-free numbers are perceived as business numbers and not personal numbers. So you get the volume capability that you get on a short code. A short code is a commercial channel. So it goes through an approval process and that's why they're so expensive. So basically what's happening over the next year or so is that the carriers are discontinuing support for shared short codes. And instead they're going to this one brand per one messaging code approach so they can keep tabs on who's sending one messages. Now, again, the, the current 10 DLC solution, uh, sorry, the, the new 10 DLC solution, which is a commercial grade, is not available across all major carriers. And it's going to have a vetting and submission process, which is to be determined yet. So these things aren't even in play yet. So what we are doing is we're sending up Vendasta accounts with a text-enabled toll-free number. And that's going to be kind of the default setup for Vendasta accounts. Now, you will have the option of the shared short code, but you have to know that it could be three months or six months before we come to you and say, hey, this shared short code is going away. We now need to transfer you over to a 10 digit number. So we're, we're defaulting with the text enabled toll free. We're currently doing about 4 million messages a month. They seem to be working really well. And uh, that volume is growing on text enabled toll free numbers. Most of our traffic is on shared short codes and we plan on making that big transition over the next six months. So initially here with Vendasta uh, partners, we're starting out the gate with text enabled toll free numbers. And if you, if you want to have a more in depth discussion on, pluses and minuses for each of these different options, we're certainly available to have that discussion with you. So I don't want to bombard everybody with too much information. As far as cost, uh, it's all inclusive in the Vendasta pricing that you are paying as a partner, okay? Uh, whether you, you're, you're using the shared short code or the, or the toll-free or the 10 DLC. All right, uh, lastly here. We are here to help you. Okay, we want to make that very clear. Um, this is new technology to most of you. Some of your clients might be doing some basic form of texting, mostly if it's like integrated into their POS system. But 
Where that lacks significant capabilities is number one, they don't own that data and they probably don't have access to that data. And that POS system cannot do text broadcasts and coupons and things like that. So there's a lot of limitations and this is where our system really kind of kicks that communication into overdrive with the kiosk and mobile coupons and things like that. So we want to be here to help you in any, any facet of your uh, onboarding process. We have FAQs where we have initial answers to common questions um, that you might come across as part of your research. We also have tutorials. So in the platform, we have extensive, extensive tutorials on step-by-step -step guides, uh, compliance, uh, best practices, things like that, all available there. And then lastly, we have a team. Uh, we're here in Los Angeles, but we also have staff in Florida. So we have East Coast, West Coast support, and we're available by phone, by email. Uh, we can do web demos for you as well on demand. As, as long as you give us a little bit of a heads up notice, we're happy to, to accommodate those uh, with you. So, you know, really don't be shy. Give us a ring. Um, if you've signed up for the system and you have questions about how it works, uh, I know a handful of you have already activated your accounts and, and started doing some messaging, give us a ring. We'll walk you through it. Uh, it usually only takes a few minutes to just give you kind of a quick rundown and address any, any questions, concerns you have. So uh, we do have a team. We're available to support you all as much uh, as you need. So um, that's all I have. I appreciate everybody's time. I'm certainly available to answer any additional questions you have. I unfortunately had to jump on late and I'm wondering how quickly we can get a copy of the video from today's meeting so that I can catch the beginning part. For sure. Um, I'll be editing this video um, as soon as it's done and you can expect it by early next week. Okay, so there's a couple questions that have come in here. One is about um, what are the products that are available in the Vendasta marketplace and do you have a link? And so that should be available right in the marketplace. Uh, if you search for mobile marketing and communications platform, uh, you'll see that in there. Um, and then as far as a uh, question here regarding integrating into a POS system, uh, first off, the integration is a very loose term. It's like saying, I need a report. What exactly kind of report do you need? What kind of integration do you need? So uh, it really depends on what POS system and then most, and then, and then what do you mean by integration? Where is information being transferred from one system to another? And so we really have to get into a little bit more detail in terms of, of how you envision that integration to take place or to happen. And what does that mean uh, exactly? Uh, and then we're happy to help you navigate those discussions with your customers, because that is a very common question is integrating with the POS. So what does that mean? Does that mean points? So when somebody makes a purchase and they've spent $50, do you then take those $50 and apply them as points towards a loyalty program? We can certainly do that with tools like Zapier. So Zapier is a common uh, integration software that, that is kind of a middle party that sits in between uh, something like the POS system and our system. Uh, and, and we can certainly do that. And this. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't hear anything. Shelly, I think you're muted. Hello. Sorry, I double clicked. So I unmuted and muted myself again. Uh, the product that you're talking about, that's, is it Trumpia? No, it's Mobile uh, Marketing and Communications Platform by iVision Mobile. I and did. I just sent the link out in the marketplace. Oh, perfect. Have any more questions? Uh, I see a question here about proximity marketing. Um, so <laughs> proximity marketing is not what we do. We do uh, mobile communications, SMS and MMS. Proximity marketing typically involves a little device that sits next to a store and that device is looking for uh, wireless, wireless devices that are in proximity. And if your phone uh, happens to be in proximity, it can trigger a message to your phone. Now what you'll find is that uh, these beacons have largely been banned by Google devices. So Google has done a, a pretty extensive job to prevent these devices from working because they're a little invasive. Imagine walking into a mall and next thing you know, your phone is getting bombarded by a bunch of pings from these beacons. So we found that these are, um, 
you know, this is what we call on the cusp technology. It's not quite there um, in terms of, of its, its effectiveness. And I would consider a little bit invasive and, and, and non-opt-in uh, non based. Uh, so that's not something that we do. It's a little bit different from uh, what our technology does. Okay, are there any more questions? Omer, would you be open to maybe showing them a bit of the dashboard? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I can certainly do that. So you'll notice that there are um, three additions and those additions uh, have um, different levels of access. So the, the plus is, uh, is the most basic of the additions. And when you log into the Plus system, it's essentially just for messaging. It doesn't have the kiosk or the coupon technology or anything like that. And you're able to um, you know, manage your mobile campaign. So what people text in, the keyword that they text into the short code and then the messages that they get back. Uh, there's a QR code feature for this that somebody can scan, which can opt them into the campaign. And then from here, you can also manage your inbox where you can uh, communicate one-on-one uh, -on -one with people. There's no inbox messages here, uh, as well as um, send out text broadcasts um, and things like that. Um, so it's very limited in terms of, 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 of features on the uh, on this particular plan. And then if you move up to the advanced plan, then you have uh, things like the digital coupons where you can create um, these visually appealing coupons for the client. So you'd upload their logo and you can really customize what that coupon experience looks like. And then you also have things like the digital kiosk where you can have um, you know, what that kiosk experience looks like uh, as well. And so all these pieces go hand in hand. This, uh, this plan also has uh, access to web forms. So you can create custom web forms that you can then put on a client's website or on their Facebook fan page if they have a certain number of uh, fans or more. So um, we go through a training on this dashboard, of course, so you don't have to worry about um, trying to figure it out on your own but it's uh, very robust, has lots of bells and whistles. And then the uh, most advanced plan, which is the Pro, uh, has access to all the bells and whistles. This includes a reminder system and includes things like the random winner selector and the URL shortener uh, that's built in the system. Um, the, the plan support MMS as well, so you can do multimedia messaging, MMS messaging, as well as SMS messaging. Um, and there's, uh, like I said, a full help and support section here where you can submit a support request or access our knowledge base with uh, video and PDF tutorials. Um, as far as preventing spamming, uh, it's all permission-based. So when, when phone numbers uh, get added in, if you were to import contacts, they, you wouldn't be able to message them. They would essentially be uh, pending consent. Uh, and so people opt in from a web form, they opt in from a kiosk, they opt in from texting in a keyword. And so you're essentially only messaging permission-based contact. So there is no messaging of, of non-permission-based contact. So it does not do spamming uh, to, that, to that effect. Um, and then the cost uh, is in here as well in the partner center. Um, and my partner center looks a little different than, than yours, so uh, as, as far as I understand it. So I think once you're in there um, and you click on the uh, product, it shows you the additions. And uh, here, I'll see if I can click on this link here. Just thinking about it. I think it may have cut off, did it cut off the link? No, that's kind of. Um, we, we do not train. Okay, so how do you know that they opted in? Okay, so I, I'm not. Okay, so if they come into the kiosk, right? If you're using a kiosk and a customer walks up to the kiosk and they click on here and they type in their phone number, they're seeing the consent language and they're hitting enter. So that is them giving their consent. Now that's a, that's a single opt-in. That means that you're basically entrusting that it's not the business owner sitting there typing in people's information. If you have any concern that you, uh, you think the business owner might be sitting there typing in people's information, then my recommendation is to make your campaign a double opt-in. And it's very easy to do that. 
You come in here and you say, okay, I want to make this a double opt-in. And now the system will prompt the person to reply why, and then they, they then reply why to confirm their opt-in. And this gives you that 100% bulletproof uh, consent that, that you need in terms of, of uh, knowing that they've consented and how they've opted in. And same thing with the web form. You'll see that the web form has all the disclaimer language on it. It says, by signing up, you agree to receive automated. So all the language is here. So if somebody's filling out this form, they're seeing the language. Now, again, it triggers a double opt-in, so you can ensure that it's the person uh, who who's, has the phone number that's getting the message. Um, as far as training here, um, do they have to opt in from the platform form? So no, uh, they don't have to opt in from the platform form. So I think this is where it gets a little convoluted and hairy and we really have to discuss with you, okay, what are you trying to do? Like, let, I'll give you a perfect example. Let's say you're working with a client and that client has a written contract and somewhere on the written contract there's a checkbox that says, I agree to receive ongoing text messaging from, you know, whatever, Joe's car service. Um, and, it, and it has the disclaimer language on the written contract with a checkbox and somebody checks the box and types in their phone number uh, or jots down their phone number. Now the client comes to you and they say, hey, I have a list of 50 contracts here with these phone numbers. I want to message those people. So clearly that's a situation where if we can vet and, and validate that the client is, is on the contract, has the right language, and they're going about it the right way, then we can certainly make those adjustments to the way your account is configured that will give you that import capability. So they don't necessarily have to opt in from one of our, our platform features like the kiosk, the web form, or texting in a keyword. Those would be kind of the three digital s solutions that our system offers right, for opting in. Uh, we also have APIs. So if somebody's opting in on another system, you, you can API into the system. Or in the case of a written contract, you can, you know, show us that and then we can we can certainly then make those designations um, we do not train your customers directly uh, typically we'll we'll train you we'll work with you and then you support your customers so um, you're going to be the liaison uh, typically we're transparent and, and kind of behind the scenes uh, so we're not going to be interfacing with your customers directly um, we can certainly do joint calls uh, so if you want to be on a call with your customer, I think that will be recommended. Uh, you do not want us dealing with your customer without you there because we don't have the, we're not billing your customer, you're billing your customer. There's a different level of engagement there. And so um, I think, you know, we'll, we'll kind of navigate that depending on, on the, the situation. Sometimes we'll deal with a partner that has a big prospect uh, and they don't want to, risk the chance that they're going to screw up the pitch, right? So they'd rather have someone like myself who has 15 years of experience talking about text messaging communication and the efficacy of it uh, to navigate that discussion. And, and I'm certainly happy to do that for you to help you lock in, lock, lock a client. So, uh, you know, feel free to utilize me. Uh, obviously, with enough heads up, I'm, I'm happy to coordinate those types of calls with you um, to help you in your, in your efforts to, to – um, to sign up a client. So uh, that is something that, you know, I typically put out there. Um, uh, do the churn customer, can they grow? Can they call you if they have questions? Do they grow the use of products? And if you had a customer list before, okay, I don't, I don't understand that question. Um, opting out is all automated by the system. So uh, somebody can text in stop and quit, unsubscribe, cancel, or remove. Those are one of the standard opt-out commands, and that will opt somebody out of future messaging. Um, and then they can opt back in by texting back into the keyword. Sometimes we'll have somebody that wants to opt out of marketing alerts, but still participate in the loyalty program. And our system supports that. So if they're using the kiosk, they can still earn points, they can still check in to earn rewards, but they're not necessarily getting the text messaging, uh, ongoing texting communication. So that's also a possibility. Um, we do not charge for inbound messages. So the credits that you are getting as part of your account are strictly for outbound messages and incoming messages are free. Um, so uh, here's a question about importing a customer list. So this is one of the slides that I went through in the presentation is, is the first question that you're going to be asked, uh, let's say you're working with Joe's Pizza, Joe's going to come to you and say, here's my customer list. I want to start messaging these people. And you're going to have to politely tell Joe, sorry, Joe, we can't do that. We can't import 
your customer list because that's not allowed. Just because somebody ordered a pizza from you two weeks ago does not mean that they've consented to receiving your marketing alerts. And so you have to make a very clear designation between a customer and an opted in subscriber. Now you can certainly convert those customers to opted in subscribers by having things like the kiosk, having things like web forms or sending a message right initially when somebody picks up a pizza that says, thank you for picking up your pizza today, reply yes to join our alerts or reply with pizza to join our club. And you can then initiate a request for somebody to opt in. But it usually should be very time sensitive to when that person is, is uh, engaging in a transaction with you if they're picking up a pizza or whatever. Um, Joe is going to come back to you and say, oh, no, no, I have, I have the customer's consent. And so it's going to be up to you to then kind of go back and say, okay, well, show me proof, show me the language. It's very specific language that has to be uh, included in the disclaimer, according to the FCC. And if you violate these guidelines, just so you know, if you violate these guidelines, it's not just that something can happen to us or the short code. It's a, it's a potential for a class action lawsuit. So the, the repercussions are substantial. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, we live in a very entrepreneurial society where there's been a lot of um, litigious you know, entrepreneurs that go out there with, the, with the, the goal of getting into a class action lawsuit. So that's why, you know, we as a provider take a, a very conservative approach uh, to messaging and to uh, opt-in consent because we're not only are we trying to ensure uh, our protection, we're trying to ensure your protection and your client's protection as well. Typically, they won't come after us. They'll go right after Joe's Pizza. And next thing you know, Joe's coming to you and saying, hey, I'm in the class action lawsuit. So you're going to say, hey, remember when you asked me to import that customer list? Well, you know, that's what happens. So um, you have to be very careful about uh, customers. And, and what you'll find is that Joe's not going to give you the customers just from the last six months. Joe's going to give you the customers from the last 15 years of being in business. So imagine, imagine that you, you always... This is my, my perspective, and this is what I tell every licensee, every client. Put yourself in the position of the consumer, okay? If you are a consumer and you went and bought a pizza from Joe five years ago, you bought one pizza, you never stepped foot in there again, and then five years down the road, you get a message from Joe, how are you going to feel as a consumer? So I always have to put myself in that position when determining the right approach to tell a client. And so, you know, if, if a client's list is six months old, mm, you know, that's kind of stretching it. We can send those people an invite to join the club, but you'll find that like doing that one time invite is going to yield like a 3% response. So if you send it to a thousand people, you might get 30 people that reply yes, but you're going to have a lot of unhappy people. And so is it really worth the negativity and the unhappy people for the 30 people that reply yes. And, and that's why I say it's not. It's not worth it for the business, to be honest with you. And that's where the business should just focus on building it organically. And that's where the kiosk has really been the game changer for our clients' businesses because the kiosk has changed the way businesses build their, their list. As a consumer, when you go to the grocery store and you check out, you type your phone number in as part of the rewards club process as part of the checkout process. So we've been conditioned as consumers that typing in your phone numbers is part of the process. And so that's why this works so well. And this is really, uh, if you're going to work, if you work with brick and mortar businesses, they should 100% have a, a tablet uh, with the kiosk in place. And you can showcase promotions and stuff here with rotating graph. You don't have to have rotating graphics. It can be a full screen a full screen display, but you can certainly do that uh, and showcase different promotions. And the nice thing about this is that it's smart. It knows when people checked in. So this is where retention comes in and you can actually send people messages that haven't checked in in a certain number of days and it's all automatic. So let's say it's been 10 days since some person last checked in and, and ordered a pizza. You can automate a message that says, hey, we miss you. Come back in and get 20% off to drive people back in. So um, I hope that addresses the questions regarding um, regarding uh, importing con uh, customer lists and, and, you know, just the concern and, and, and things to be aware of. Uh, there's no fee for the kiosk. Uh, we do not provide the tablet, okay? So uh, we provide the software that powers the tablet, and then we can certainly make recommendations on different tablets that you can use. We like to use these uh, refurbished iPad 2s. 
they're very inexpensive. They're typically um, like 75 to 100 bucks uh, at Walmart.com. They're nice 10-inch white tablets. They look really clean and they're very, very reliable. Um, they use Wi-Fi, and so um, we provide the software behind it, and then you provide the tablet. And we have a stand that is on uh, in the partner center here um, that is available uh, that we sell, but you certainly don't have to use it. Uh, and I'll make one other one other interesting note is that this kiosk it can exist anywhere. It can exist on a smartphone. It can exist on a tablet. It can exist on a, on a Android or Windows-based POS system. At the end of the day, it's a web page. Now, we don't want to advertise that because we don't want consumers going and checking themselves in from the comfort of their couch. But in, in reality, it's a web page. So we give you the technology that powers it. You decide where you want to put it, whether it's an iPad or a Galaxy Tab. Um, all those devices work very well. We stopped using the Galaxy Tabs because after about two or three years, the battery starts to swell up and the things fall apart. So we've really been sticking with these refurbished iPad 2s, and they're very inexpensive and very reliable. And, uh, and they're a really nice, clean uh, display, nice, large display. So we're really happy with those. Um, there is no, no fee other than the package that you're in. So uh, the, the Plus plan, which is the most basic of the plans, does not include the kiosk. Okay? But the next plan, the advanced plan, which is the middle, the middle plan, that does. Okay, and so um, and each plan also includes an allotment of messages. Okay, so you don't have to worry about purchasing messages in addition to; they're included with the monthly uh, monthly price for the plan. All right, I'm going to jump in here real quick and share um, the partner center page. Just to go through it, um, go through the plans that we have, also the add-ons that are available. All right, so I assume that you see my screen. This is the mobile marketing and communications platform product page in the marketplace. And if you want to see the pricing and comparison, you simply click on this little tab here, additions and pricing, and then you can compare. So Omer was explaining that with the plus, you don't get the kiosk, but here we see under the next two um, plans that we do have the kiosk and then generally the pro just includes everything that are in plus and advanced plus other features. So if you want to go and, you know, like review this in detail, you can do so through the marketplace product page. Um, so 1,000, 5,000 and 10,000 message credits for each of our plans. And if that is not enough for your clients, you can always add on um, bulk messaging credits um, and they expire one month from the date that uh, from the day of issue. So 1,000 to 25,000 message credits are available to add on. And we also have the digital kiosk stand uh, that Omer mentioned that can help you know, um, prop up the tablets or the devices that your clients have um, for their digital kiosks. Yeah, um, that's all I had to share. Are there any other questions? The, uh, there is a suggested markup there. Um, you'll see the uh, the pricing on the on the marketplace does show you the suggested retail price as well, and and there's really nice margins on the messaging. So um, it is a nice a nice recurring revenue stream. And the nice thing about the businesses is once they start to build their database, they're sending more and more messages each month. So the the volume of messages happens to just grow over time, uh, and it creates for a nice recurring revenue. Once the business really gets behind the text messaging and becomes a really nice core part of their communication, and they tend to do it long term. Okay. Kurt says, uh, glad you joined. Great product to promote. Awesome. Oh, Shelly, um, if you head on to the FAQs underneath, there is a frequently asked question that um, says, what is the suggested retail price per edition? So there is a range, but generally you can, uh, for plus, for example, you can charge as much as, much as 40% over, um, over the wholesale cost. There's a question here regarding exporting. So uh, it's important to note that no data is locked into the system. You can easily access all your data and export it in real time. So there's an export button right on the contacts page. All right, well, if that is it for today, then if you have any other questions, you can always hit the uh, contact us button on the product page for iVision Mobile for their mobile marketing communications platform, or you can always send us an email at marketplace at vendasta.com.
thank you, Omer, uh, for you know thank you going guys. through that presentation. We learned so much about, especially with the you know the industry compliance and really you know emphasizing what the impacts it are if uh, businesses don't follow these standards. So, and it's a fantastic product jam-packed with features so i hope uh, your clients um for all our attendees i hope your clients will you know um use this product and uh you know it'll be a good monthly recurring revenue for your business as well so yeah. thanks everyone and i hope to thank see you. you for our next thanks, uh, interactive product webinar have a good day